wonder what would happen if I did a little bit of a deep dive into the debunker rabbit hole. You can take the height of the Great Pyramid and multiply by 43,200 and you get the polar radius of the Earth. No, you don't. 455 feet is the height of the pyramid. 43,200 times 455 feet is 3,000... Yes, I'm sure the ancient Egyptians were measuring their pyramids in English feet. Next. I don't know if Graham Hancock is a racist. I don't know if Graham Hancock is a white supremacist. He may or may not be. Oh, boy. <sighs> Next. I'd like to know what he means by civilization, because... I watched the first couple episodes, and he didn't really define what he was talking about. Dude, get a haircut and shave. Maybe nobody's going to take you serious looking the way you do. Next. Here, locally in California, we were excavating at a level that really is at about 13,000 years ago. It's right near the end of the last ice age where Graham talks about some ancient civilization, ancient advanced civilization that may have been there that archaeologists deny. And, and I'm here to say that he's right. Let me show you, let me show you what we found. Next. Ancient aliens, Atlantis reborn, and now ancient apocalypse are not big archeology span keeping the truth from us. It's an insidious plot to make white supremacist conspiracy theories consumable to a general audience. Uh, 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 uh. We're going to be responding to a world of antiquity again in this video. Uh. Well, hello, and welcome back to the next episode of Dedunking. And that's right, we're doing Dr. David Miano again in this video because I am not dealing with those nut jobs I just showed you. I, I mean, the one dude with the long hair, I just picked him in there because I needed a long hair to make fun of for a second, LOL. So, yeah, he wasn't so bad. His video was, it was a little bland, but, I mean, he's an academic, so, duh. In this one, we're going to be doing Dr. David Miano's Why He Doesn't Believe in Advanced Lost Civilization. And you, I'm going to do two things here. Number one, I'm going to point out how many times he goes for like the lowest possible hanging fruit. It's like, oh man, he's, he's like half a step away from accusing everybody the standard position to be freaking electric pyramids and psychic fucking telecommunication networks around the globe and shit. I mean, he's like that far from that. But in addition to that... I'm going to highlight something I brought up a couple times in the past, but I'm, I'm going to kind of drive it home a little bit in this one. So you'll need to know who the Sea Peoples were again really quickly. They're a hypothetical group of people. We don't know for sure that they even existed, but they're pretty sure they existed. The archaeologists and people that study all that crap pretty much assume that they existed. Uh, the Egyptians wrote around them some. There's some other people I'm pretty sure that wrote around them a little bit. Uh, they got the... They, nobody knows where they came from. We've got no artifacts of them. We don't know what ethnicity they were. We don't know anything about them except for what was written down. We have literally no idea of anything else about them. So I'm going to use that a few times as a metaphor here. So if you hear Dr. Miano say sea people when you think he might be supposed to be saying lost advanced civilization or some shit like that, you know why. All right. Now enjoy the rest of the album. I have to acknowledge that not everyone believes the same things about this proposed lost advanced civilization. Some attribute it to aliens, for example, while others simply to great humans of the past. But they do hold many ideas in common, which I think I can fairly summarize. Almost all of them perceive it to have been quite large, continent-spanning in fact, on a scale approximately on par with the British Empire. This idea goes back to the 1800s at least. Perfect example of what I was saying. This is a position that not many people that I'm aware of maintained that the civilization was supposed to be globe spanning back in the day. The sun never set on the Atlantean Empire. I never heard nothing like that before, except for from the extremists. There are some people that believe that kind of thing. But I mean, Graham Hancock posited, like even in Fingerprint of the Gods, that they were all on Antarctica and then spread out afterwards. And like nowadays, he's like Gobekli Tepe. He believes that that is a place of a transference of technology. They weren't settled there before the Younger Dryas impact or whatever. 
they came there afterwards to teach the hunter gatherers so that their knowledge wasn't lost so he's like he's like doing the same kind of backwards shit actually that uh tiger star did not exactly backwards in the same regards but slightly where it's like oh yeah they were all over the place and so why don't we find evidence of their cities in the americas it's like dude they didn't go to the americas until after the apocalypse according to this hypothesis now if you set that kind of standard, we could make it really difficult to believe the sea people existed. Where, where'd they come from? You don't know where they came from, so we'll do the same thing. We'll just assume that they came from everywhere, right? Is that how we play this game? See, this is what I mean. You could take the, the, the least favorable position on this shit and just make the worst possible assumption, and all of a sudden it sounds really ludicrous. But I don't think anybody in their right mind that believes in these things would posit either that the sea peoples or the Atlanteans were settled all around the world. One very common argument is that many artifacts and works of architecture, and they are almost exclusively made of stone, by the way, that are attributed to known ancient and medieval and even early modern societies are actually from this lost civilization. And that we know this because these artifacts or buildings are too impressive for them to have been made by those societies. What makes them too impressive? Their perfection or their weight? That's pretty slimy, to be honest with you. It's not about the accuracy or the weight. It's the two together. The accuracy is doable if it's a stick in the ground. And the weight is doable. They can carry big blocks. I don't think any of us would dispute that. But the setting them and making it look really, really, really good, and making it really, really, really accurate. Well, that's a different thing, but you're bypassing that, and you're making it either one or the other, so you don't actually have to address the meat of the argument, even in regards to the big stones. Perfection meaning they're made so precisely, so accurately, that ancient people or ancient technology would have been unable to produce it. And weight, meaning that they are so heavy, that ancient people or ancient technology would not have been able to move it. Now, it seems to me that both of these beliefs underestimate the capabilities of ancient craft workers and can only have been devised by someone with superficial knowledge of ancient societies and a limited understanding of physics. And the position that the Great Pyramid, for example, could be built by putting those 20 ton stones down every two or three or five minutes and making them perfectly aligned to the four cardinal points, that's the kind of thing that could only be held by somebody who has a superficial knowledge of how things are squared in construction and a limited understanding of basic building techniques. Because that is absurd. And you talk to anybody who's worked construction and you'll find it the same kind of deal. And this is funny because this is kind of one of those, you see guys have probably seen before the engineer memes and the mechanics threads and stuff like this guy right there. Um, and I experienced the same kind of thing when I worked as an electrician. You know, every now and again, and especially, would always be these big medical buildings. It was never in a house. It was always something big and fancy where they had to hire a, a big architect to sit down. And a couple of times they would like put the ductwork and the electrical and the plumbing all like into one bay, like one little negative space area that they had designated for it. But you can't do that. You can't put wiring and plumbing and ductwork in the same spot. You can put the wiring and the plumbing next to each other, but ductwork's got to have its own space, man. You can't have wiring going through that. You'll spread fire everywhere. It... <sighs> anyway, <laughs> it doesn't work, but they don't get that because they don't put their hands on it. They just write it on a piece of paper. And, and this is the same kind of thing where you see a lot of the cool things that the archaeologists that like put their hands on these things will do. And you'll see like a lot of, of things that have been demonstrated that are very interesting. But they're not doing anything remotely with the scale and accuracy of something like the pyramids at Giza. And that's really where it's, it's like all that other stuff, in my opinion, is kind of it's interesting, but it really it doesn't address like the fundamental shit. The, the, those three things are super enigmatic. That's why they call us pyramidiots, right? We're, we're, not, we're not all crazy about the Bimini Road. Some of us are. We're not all crazy about the Piri Rees map. Some of us are. But the pyramids... That's what we always talk about. It's what we always go back to. That's what I bitched about Hancock for not bringing up an ancient apocalypse a few times, right? Okay. With all the talk of perfection and precision stonework, I have rarely seen more than just a small handful of measurements to establish this. 
and they're frequently done in a very casual, incomplete manner. Most of the time, people just eyeball them and call them precise. But when talking about precision and accuracy, there is no such thing as an exact or perfect measurement. There is a number with an assigned uncertainty. I almost never see those numbers. Next time you watch a video or read a book about a precision artifact, ask yourself, did they take these measurements in a scientific manner? Did they take all the measurements, every angle inside? Did they take measurements on all the pertinent objects? And did they show you all of these measurements? You will find the answer is usually no for every one of these questions. And so he calls into question the validity of the measurements. And again, in situations like this, we can all assume that we're talking about the pyramids. It makes a great case study because that's the best piece of evidence we're going to hold up in these regards. So I'll post the picture right here of the measurements that were taken by Planters Petrie like a hundred and some odd years ago. And you'll see the fancy little plus or minus symbol next to him. I, I, I think he measured all the stuff. I, I think... It's probably a good assumption that the father of Egyptology probably got this one right. And then if he, even if he didn't, like Robert Leonard has done this again in the mid 80s and they've done some digitization and stuff in the modern day. And I'll post measurements and stuff for you to look over here and you can see how absurdly accurate these things are. Um, he ignores this he makes a broad generalization when i'm not really aware of many people going batshit crazy with measurements about many other buildings on the earth these are the only ones that i've really i mean every now and again you'll hear somebody bring something else up but this is the one where it's just like dude this is so accurate this is so big this th these are the three buildings that are super enigmatic in that regards he knows there's good data on those and he knows those are the ones we're going to hold up but he's going to be slippery about it and pretend, oh, they just do their shitty measurements. Now, what about the weight of these artifacts? This is where physics comes in. As any physicist will tell you, it is possible to calculate mathematically what can and can't be moved with measurable forces and known tools. My brother in science, you have to be off the deep end to think that the ancients couldn't move a big rock. Moving the big rock isn't the issue. And that's why you separating the accuracy from the weight is a slippery way for you to make this argument without actually contending with the real issue that's caused by dovetailing those two together. Another common argument you will get is an appeal to myth. What? Yes, appeal to myth. By myth, I mean traditional stories about the origins of things, which involve the supernatural. The reasoning usually given is that myths contain an element of historical truth. And myths often speak of primeval times long ago when the gods lived. In their interpretation of these myths, the alternative history folks will substitute for these gods aliens or great humans, whom they say later people misunderstood as gods. And the societies these gods ruled over are interpreted to be part of a lost advanced civilization. While I do think it is reasonable to suppose that ancient legends, that is stories that feature human characters, may have elements of historical fact in them. A problem I have with this kind of reasoning concerning myth, that is stories of the gods, is that it doesn't take the creators of the myths at their word. It ignores the genre of the writing, not understanding what myths were for or why they were composed, it tries to turn a religious or sacred story into science, and this destroys it. Now, it's very suspect to me that he's trying to say that myths about gods are one thing and myths about men are another thing. When we have seen time and time again throughout history, people being twisted into deified figures from Alexander the Great to King Arthur to the cargo cults of the modern day that just came in the uh, uh, wake of World War II. For those of you who aren't aware, um, there's a bunch of Melanesian islands uh, that in World War II, both Americans and Japanese would use the islands for airstrips, and they really hadn't been visited for a long time before that. And the people would show up there and they would trade all these goods to the natives, and the natives had no concept of like mass producing steel knives, for example, and they were just blown away by the thing. And so, like, we come back 
hundreds of years, or <laughs> we come back a couple decades after World War II, and there's uh, these cults set up, people worshiping American soldiers that haven't been there in a long time and like building fake airstrips and shit. They totally turn these people into gods. People with better technology were turned into gods in the course of a couple of generations. Let me say that again. People with better technology were turned into gods in their myths in the course of a couple generations. And I know this well-educated man is very aware of those cargo cults. No, he might not have put the two together. I'll give him that. But um, this is pretty... It's pretty basic stuff, my dumbass knows it, right? In support of the claim that this lost civilization was quite large, that it existed all over the globe, alternative history proponents point to similarities they find in artifacts on different continents. So, for example, they might say, hey, look over here. We have buildings that are bigger on the bottom than on the top. And over here, we also have buildings that are bigger on the bottom than the top. Oh, so you do know the pyramids exist. Now you're going to bring them up when you can just conflate them with the pile of rocks. But not when we're going to talk about accurate measurements. No, don't bring those up. Now, why don't we bring up something like these? You'll find these all over the world. There should be labeled the bottom of them if the image that I remember being out there is right. Um, they're at the tops of these megalithic structures all over the world. They'll find these indentations carved into the top of them, sometimes different shapes, but very, very similar. And it's like metal or something was used to hold these rocks together at the top. And yes, a lot of the things that are brought up that people say, you know, the fact that they are doing X and X in different parts of the world is proof. Now, a lot of times that is just like, okay, these would be something, a similar problem, a similar solution. But this is a very elegant and unique solution for a problem that in a lot of cases, I mean, a lot of these rocks are still standing thousands and thousands of years later, right? I mean, you didn't really need metal to tie them together, but this was standard operating procedure and it was how they did it on both sides of the oceans. And that's kind of a big deal. But we don't need to talk about that. Let's just talk about how they stack rocks. So disingenuous in this video, man. Just so, so disingenuous. Yeah, but aren't there a ton of stories around the world that match Plato's Atlantis story? No, there are not. I can't think of one. In order to make the claim that the Atlantis tale matches other stories, you would have to broaden the parameters so that the only similarity is a water disaster that kills a bunch of people. That's pretty much it. You'd also have to eliminate the setting because none of the dates for these disasters, when stories provide the dates, match. It's just too broad to be meaningful. The Egyptian pharaoh Samtik, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is said to have conducted one of those language deprivation experiments where they take kids and don't teach them anything. He wanted to determine which race was older, the Egyptians or the Phrygians. And so he deprived two kids of language until one of them said the word for bread, and apparently they said it in Phrygian, so according to their determination, the Phrygians were the older race. Now, why would you care so much which race was older, that you would abuse a couple of kids over it, even, even back in the day when that kind of shit was a lot more common? It, it was a point of cultural pride, still is, to being the oldest in a certain area. If you take the city of Troy, for example, the Greeks were historians at this point, right? They were writing it down, and they still didn't get the right dates. I mean, they, they got things, they, they weren't perfect, right? They had these different guys had different dates, up to 100 years off or so. That's, that's how this shit works, man. Now imagine unrecorded dates and people trying to brag up of which culture was oldest, and that's just one dynamic as to why they would lie about it. I'm sure there are several others. I'm just spitballing the one out here because I'm well aware that that's something that ancient cultures and modern cultures alike consider a big deal. So again, we return to Dr. Miano holding up myths and expecting them to be more accurate than they're going to be by any expectation. So why is there so much emphasis on a common impact? Well, because ever since Ignatius Donnelly, it's been part of the story. It's the only part of the argumentation that has made it into peer-reviewed journals. And perhaps most importantly, it helps to make the theory unfalsifiable. In other words, if it can be shown that a worldwide cataclysm occurred, that would explain 
why the remnants of this lost advanced civilization are gone. And so, and when anyone objects to the claim of a lost civilization by asking for proof, it can be said, ah, the proof has been destroyed. But falsifiability in science is essential because scientific claims have to be testable. So either we have a complete misrepresentation or a complete misunderstanding of the position of how this stuff has been because Earth crust displacement theory was at the forefront of this for a very long time. Like I covered a little bit in the last video, Charles Abgood was in the 50s, man, and then Hancock was writing this book in the 90s. That's 40 years of Earth crust displacement theory. It, it hasn't been... The, the, the common hypothesis is just now a thing in the modern day because the science is starting to say that it looks like it might have happened. And yes, a huge part of science is falsifiability, but don't make the mistake of putting archaeology on the same plane of capable of falsifiability of something like astronomy or physics, because it's not. You guys have a lot of spitballing. Again, sea peoples. Falsifiability? Pfft. You got none of it with them. Zero whatsoever. You just have to assume they existed or assume that they didn't. <laughs> but you're going to assume that they did exist and you're going to assume that these other guys didn't exist and your evidence for both is basically some words on a piece of paper or carved in a rock. Okay, so those are the reasons I don't think the arguments for a lost advanced civilization hold up. But I also have reasons against a lost advanced civilization. Reasons why I think it is improbable. First, the complete lack of archaeological evidence for it. Like the Sea Peoples? So then, it all falls back on the argument that the Cataclysm wouldn't have preserved anything. That also I find hard to believe. We have an archaeological record stretching all the way back through the Stone Age, and everything in it, everything, falls along the line of technological progression. We have artifacts made of all kinds of materials besides stone, bone and wood, ceramics, etc. But none of it points to an advanced civilization. And the only response I have heard to this is that all the cities would have been on the coast and a flood would have wiped them out before anyone could move inland. Well, allow me to be the first person to offer you a different position then. I'll say something first that I pointed out to Mini Minuteman in a response that high tech would be scavenged like mad even if it was like high tech in the form of like metal and people are in the stone age it would be scavenged like mad again with those cargo colts try going down there just 80 years later and finding a steel knife just laying around i bet there's none i bet they have them all locked up with the richest people on that island and they're worshipped as fucking relics Anyway, that's just me assuming. That's just spitballing, right? Let, let's let's look at some of the real stuff here. You claim that everything's where it's supposed to be as far as technology goes, but we do have things that pop up, like the Antikythera mechanism or the Aleopile, and there's a few other things that if you look around throughout history, they just kind of seem weird that they shouldn't quite be there. Wow, that's a lot of understanding. Well, Greek fire shows a pretty good understanding of chemistry for a people that shouldn't really have that great of a knowledge of chemistry. It doesn't mean that the Greek fire was something, that some gift from an ancient civilization or anything. I'm not trying to lump that in with all the rest of the stuff. My point is, is that there are plenty of things that are technologically out of place throughout history. Where are the remnants of the cities? Show me the cities or anything from them. Are we talking about the Sea Peoples again, Dr. Miata? If there were a continent-spanning civilization. We should expect to find plant and animal species being exchanged. After all, if there was communication and trade, there would no doubt be imports coming from other parts of the world. And yet, the evidence points instead to geographical isolation of animals, of plants, and yes, of people. A big deal has been made of human genetic material recently being found that connects South America with Australia, but this does not point to contact between many parts of the world for a long time. We should have evidence of a considerable amount of genetic mixing, and we don't. The evidence points very clearly to notable genetic isolation. 
Now, do you remember in the beginning when I pointed out that he was claiming that this lost civilization was the size of the British Empire, was being not very honest because it was being like the easiest to debunk version of this whole thing and it's not a position that I hold or a lot of other people hold? Now, here's why. He can dismiss genetic evidence now because he needs a lot of genetic evidence. Trace amounts won't work because that that doesn't mean shit anymore buddy you you need tons of it because you had the british empire where's british empire levels of evidence it's so it's, it's slimy it's just disingenuous he, he and i'm sure that he's well aware that this is how he crafted the argument then there is the complete lack of genetic or archaeological evidence for crop domestication and animal domestication besides the dog from those times in fact genetics is very clear that there was no livestock before the Younger Dryas period, nor was there genetic manipulation of plants. You can't have an advanced civilization without agriculture. And another example of why he needs that civilization to be way up there so that he can pick the low-hanging fruit. Now, if Gobekli Tepe could be built by hunter-gatherers and they had enough of a surplus of food to spend tons of time building these megalithic structures, as I'm sure Dr. Miano believes, then there's no reason to believe that somebody couldn't figure out how to build boats or how to smelt metal or something simple along those lines while still living in a hunter-gatherer culture. Something that takes a few hundred hours a month, the same as building these giant megalithic structures. That, that's the thing is that they'll Sure, if you got computers and shit, yeah, you're probably going to need a surplus of food that you're not going to be able to get through hunter-gathering, but you guys have established with Gobekli Tepe that low-level technological things can be done without a gigantic surplus of food, so that's the table that you guys set. Now you're going to have to eat there, buddy. I don't know what to tell you. These reasons lead me to the inescapable conclusion, not merely that the evidence for a lost advanced civilization in the Stone Age is lacking, but that it is improbable, that such evidence will ever be found. That being said, there is a way I think it is possible that evidence for a lost advanced civilization might be discovered. And that is if we lower our expectations. First, we would have to let go of the idea that it spanned continents. It's just way too unrealistic and it's out of harmony with the evidence. You don't fucking say. And second, we would have to look for it after the invention of agriculture and animal domestication. If we do that, I think it is quite possible that a previously unknown, advanced, for its time, civilization could be found. And again, Dr. Miano's position on Gobekli Tepe proves that he doesn't really hold this position across the board. He wouldn't uh, say that they had to have a huge surplus of food in order to build all that stuff. So it kind of shows that these double standards that you've seen throughout the entire video, to be honest with you, where the Sea Peoples have more evidence for them than Graham Hancock's lost civilization, for example. I will grant him that. However... The cudgel that he uses to beat this lost civilization out of existence in the uh, academic sphere, he would never wield against the sea peoples, or he wouldn't have sea peoples in his worldview anymore. And that's my point with that. And the same thing with Gobekli Tepe. He will never say you need this massive food supply in order to advance technology here, but he will definitely say it over there, especially when he's holding the level of the civilization way up here so that it's super easy to debunk. Yeah, man, if we expect that aliens were flying pyramids down from Mars to settle the planet, I'm with you. That's probably bullshit. Can we talk about something a little bit more grounded now? No, of course not. <sighs> oh, well, I stuck my nose in the rabbit hole and this is what I get. Thanks a lot, guys. I appreciate everybody uh, liking and subscribing and um, I just keep having more and more of you show up so keep watching and i'll keep making these um thank you very much and have a good evening so i'm making this video not just for archaeologists not just for the people i already know working in archaeology but also for folks who might be interested and drawn into pseudo archaeology to engage with you folks and to open the door to people who are interested in archaeology. A few moments later. And it's interesting that both Hancock and his supporters and defenders are 
seemingly most upset and most offended by that label, by being associated with that. And I get that. Nobody wants to be a white supremacist. 